Well, good morning, everybody, um, and it's great to be with you this morning. My name is James Toomey, and I'm CEO of Mission Australia. And today, my special guest is Margaret Chambers, um, OAM. First, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, your video has been switched off and you've been, and been muted for the duration of the event. If you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box using the chat function, and we'll, uh, we'll come to those later on um, at the end of the conversation that I had with Margaret. I'd also like to acknowledge that where we are, we're on traditional land, and I acknowledge the traditional custodians of, of the land that I'm on today, which is the Gurungai land north of Sydney. Uh, it does say Gadigal on the slide because um, I was supposed to be in Sydney this morning, but I had a, a COVID test yesterday. I'm perfectly all right, but I need to isolate um, until I get the results. So I'm still at home this morning. I'm on Ga I'm Gurungai land and Margaret is on Gundagara land. And we both pay our respects to the elders past and present. So they hold the culture, memories and dreams of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And we recognize and respect their cultural heritage beliefs and continual relationship with the land. And we recognize the importance of young people who are our future leaders. I would also like to welcome this morning, everybody from the, uh, members of the Benjamin Short Society, the Society of Confirmed Requesters to Mission Australia, named after the founder of Sydney City Mission Benjamin Short. And we're here today to chat with Margaret about her husband, Charles, his book, Coming Together, A Dynamic Vision, The Events That Shaped Mission Australia, and the almost 40 years he devoted wholeheartedly to the city mission movement. Much of the credit for the existence of Mission Australia in its present form and the nature and the scope of its current work belongs to him. So welcome, Margaret. It's our pleasure to have you as our special guest today. I understand that on this day, 70 years ago, you and Charles were married. So it's a very special day for you to be talking about his long association with our organization. Thank you to the Mitigong RSL for your generosity in providing a room and setting up the technology for Margaret and her chat uh, today. I'm very grateful for your assistance in that. So Margaret, I'm gonna move on to some questions now. Um, and before we start talking about Charles' dedication to the city mission movement for almost 40 years, let's talk about some of your achievements. Not only did you support Charles in his work, but you also managed to involve yourself in your own community work. In 1997, you were awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia in recognition of services to the aged, particularly through the Harbison Memorial Retirement Village and to the community through church, school and welfare groups. And in 2012, you were made patron of the Barrel CWA, after 40 years of faithful service to the organization. And I know that she's uh, had a, endured a pretty cold winter down in the Southern Highlands. Um, and she was uh, explaining that her power bill had been quite extreme uh, over the winter. And I think this is very much something which has affected a number of people uh, over the last winter and affects elderly people. And we see it show up in some of the services that we provide, in fact, that um, uh, you know, the cost of heating and the cost of cooling actually in summer is something which uh, a lot of people find very challenging and, and maybe um, you know, building adaptation in, in Australia isn't what it could be and certainly as we look forward to um, or as we see coming towards us um, probable changes in, in the climate in Australia, um, you know, severe, uh, much, perhaps much hotter summers and much colder winters maybe or wetter. Um, that one of the challenges that we see in, in, in the people that we serve as an organization is actually it's very hard to adapt to those changes. There can be costly things to adapt to. And if you have, a, if you're a person with a low income or um, in, in other ways, uh, you know, living in poverty or, or challenged very significantly economically, um, uh, then, you know, these sorts of adaptations are very difficult to, to do in your house. And if you are um, a tenant of a, uh, you know, your tenant rather than actual owner of a property, obviously it's um, difficult sometimes to get your landlord to um, engage in those sorts of adaptations. And this is one of the things that we see showing up. One of the more current things that we deal with as an organization, much of what Mission Australia continues to do, and particularly in the area of homelessness, for example, and, and we'll talk to Margaret about Mission Beat in a moment, um, is quite similar work to the work that we were doing uh, some years ago. Similar 
from the point of view of um, if it's a homeless outreach service outreaching to rough sleepers on the streets of Sydney, um, that is still very much an important part of the role. What we then do and how we've adapted our practices over time and, and evolved the work that we have done to move away from just being a sort of treatment so work. But I can see that Margaret has joined us now, which is uh, very exciting. Um, Margaret, I had mentioned um, that uh, I, I don't know if you were online when I mentioned this is your, it would have been your 70th wedding anniversary for you and Charles. And we're very flattered um, to be here to talk about Mission Australia and the work of Charles in particular. But before we get on to the work of Charles, I did have a question, which was, uh, which is, you know, where do you fit it all in? You've got a, um, uh, an OAM for your work with uh, aged people. You're uh, uh, a, uh, been honoured by Barrel CWA by being made patron after 40 years of faithful service. I know that you're engaged in your local church community and school and other welfare groups. So really interested to hear about, um, you know, how do, how, do you, how do you do all of that? How do you fit it all in? Well, James, it's, you know, that span is 40 years and it, things develop. They didn't all happen at once. <laughs> My first uh, foray into uh, that sort of thing was uh, with Jenny's school, uh, the Parents and Friends Association. From that, um, I took a whole group of young people from our church out to Harbison, uh, which is an aged care place in our district. And they did gardening on a Saturday afternoon. And from that, I was asked to join the committee of Harbison. So things develop over the years in a natural succession. And Charles was away from uh, six o'clock on Monday morning until mid-afternoon Friday. So I had to fill my days with some interesting things <laughs> and also be interesting for him to come home to <laughs> at the end of the week and have things to talk about. Well, so, that's, a... so that's how it all developed. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a wonderful way of looking at it. And, uh, and a comment there on, on Charles's dedication, you know, the time that he spent on the work that he did. And um, and interested in knowing and understanding um, a little bit more about Charles's motivation for becoming involved in Sydney City Mission in the first place. Can you talk to that? Well, um, it all began, as he says in his book, by a phone call from a very dear friend, Hal Swanton, who we'd known for many years, who had been pres who was actually a president of the council of the Sydney City Mission then, as it was called, and uh, he rang Charles and asked him if he would consider joining the uh, organisation. And Charles felt uh, that we had been so blessed in our own lives, and we both grew up in families that cared for people, and uh, always tried to work with people from other other races as well. My, my home was always full of uh, people from missionary backgrounds in Africa because I grew up in London. And so we just felt it was a natural progression for that. And uh, I have to say, and you know, James, yourself, that it was the happiest 40 years of his life. He much preferred that to all the business things he'd been involved with before. Yes, and, uh, and, and also some thread there coming through, Margaret, of um, not just being content to do something and to uh, continue doing it the way perhaps it had always, always been done, but to push the boundaries of being able to do something, something different, something better. And one of the uh, key things that he was so heavily associated with uh, in the organization is Mission Beat. And I know that he is not the only person um, uh, who was involved in the, in the genesis of that idea. Um, but perhaps you can talk to us a little bit about um, how it was that your, your, your recollections, and they're in the book as well, but your recollections of how Mission Beat itself came into being. Well, it all really began with uh, Charles had a, mission, a, a business trip to the United States and he saw some wonderful work being done in Toronto and also in New York. And then when we got to London, he saw David Shepherd, who was known as a cricketer, uh, with his Shepherd Centre in London. And they were, were, were going out to people more and he felt that the mission could very well do things like that. 
And uh, when he came back from that trip, um, his co-worker who was wonderful with this was Merle Herkham. And she went overseas and actually investigated the Bowery mission in New York who had trucks going out. Uh, they always carried guns, but no mission beat uh, uh, van has guns. And uh, she came back with that. And she also came back with that wonderful idea of vocational employment training scheme. And so that's how the whole thing began. And uh, it took a while for it to be established in Sydney. And it wasn't until the 1980s that the mission beat, uh, as you well know, uh, began. Yeah, and a, and a great innovation and one that we are incredibly grateful for that innovation and also really proud of the work that we continue to do. And I was talking a little bit about how we've um, adapted the service that we offer through Mission Beat. And we're still staying uh, you know, true to the principles of the outreach, the importance of actually going out and um, engaging with people where they are, which is you know rough sleeping on the streets of Sydney. That's as, right. That's an important yes. way of, of yes. having engagement. So we're incredibly grateful um, for that for that legacy. But other other things that Charles was involved with, and I and I know that he was so instrumental in the development of our um, early childhood services in what was then Green Valley. And I remember reading. I know the reading in the book. This was these are the days when um, someone of Charles's. Uh, Stasis was able to ring up a government minister and and shake them down for you know a lazy million dollars here and there. I can tell you that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> so I'm very I'm very jealous yes, yes. that he had that kind of influence. But he he was so catalytic uh, around uh, developing, getting the building in Green, what was then Green Valley. It's now we now call it Miller, but it was it was the Green Valley area at the time. And yeah. I know that you attended the opening of that centre with yeah. Charles. Um, um, and were, were involved also in, the, in some of the work of the early years. Um, and uh, my question is, did you get to meet Princess Anne, who I know <laughs> was there? Yes, opening? I did. <laughs> it was her first um, uh, thing on her own, from uh, away from Her Majesty. And uh, she and the Queen were out here on a visit on the Britannia. And she had been sent out for her first foray into uh, community life. And I think that she was very nervous. And when it came to the end and she was asked to sign the book by Hal Swanton and his wife, who were the president of the mission at that time, uh, she put the wrong date. And she looked up at my husband and I and said, don't tell mummy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, yeah, I can imagine. So, that. But that's, that began her wonderful life, and you know how marvellous she has worked so hard and has yeah. always been available for everything like that, has yeah. a real heart for uh, homelessness and all those sort of things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. And we do, and we, we continue as an organisation, actually, our, our, to have the, the honour of, as our patron, uh, the Governor General of Australia, and that's something which um, successive Governors General have uh, have undertaken uh, um, uh, in terms of that connection with Mission Australia, which is incredibly important to us, and those connections are obviously very important. To us. Yes, that's right. Yes, and many of them have gone out on the Mission Beat bands, as yes. you would remember. Yeah, yeah yes. absolutely. Yes. Mm. And another another major innovation, and again one which we are. We are so proud of at Mission Australia was um, what is called Triple Care Farm, which is near Robertson in Southern Highlands, mm -hmm. not that far from you, in fact. And uh, over the over the years of that, uh, the, the farm, which is a, a drug and alcohol youth rehabilitation and training uh, uh, opportunity for it's a three month program that young people mm -hmm. spend there. Over three thousand young people have walked mm -hmm. through those doors and come out uh, with life-changing support yes. from the work that's been undertaken by the magnificent team there at, at Triple Care Farm. Um, and you have been to, and every year, as you know, there's a graduation and around about December. Um, the weather is either scorching hot or freezing cold, or possibly both, all at the same, uh, in, in one day, as you know. 
You've been to many of those graduations. Yes, what, what can you talk to? Perhaps you can tell us some well, of your... The most memory. wonderful thing about going to those, and I've been to almost all of them now, except, of course, we didn't have one last year because of the COVID. And I don't know whether they're able to have one this year yet. We haven't heard. Um, was, is, well, is the fact of the parents and their reaction when they see their young people restored to uh, what, you know, a, a good life again, and the tears. It's, uh, it's and grandmothers who, who have had to um, help these people through these awful times. And, um, you know, until you hear their stories, you don't realize what families have gone through with people with addiction. Mm. And uh, I come away every time, uh, and especially since Charles uh, died, uh, with that lovely feeling that the work is going on. And I know that you would like to see it replicated, you know, throughout Australia, but it's a, a very expensive thing to run. That's that's right. It certainly is, and uh, and you and you picked up on there something which I always find every year. The a parent will say, "I got my child back." Yes, exactly. Um, and this this sense of loss to alcohol and drugs, and then the sense of restoration yes. in the program is is very powerful. And you've picked up on that. Yes. and you're right. We would like to do it in more places. We're very very fortunate in the way in which we are supported in the funding by. The Sir David Martin Foundation. I know Sir David was a friend of Charles, yeah. and they were, you know, together. Well, it was his really idea that uh, the whole thing was done, and Charles worked with him. And all the credit, you know, goes to Sir David and his vision, because really it all comes down to a vision of helping other people. And Sir David was so good at that. Well, and, uh, and we were also supported there by, by the Fairfax family, who were very much part of the yes. decision to buy the farm in the first place. You say these things aren't, aren't even, we're very grateful for that. that you know, it's an incredibly important foundational donation. But again, yes. the theme that comes through is Charles and Charles's determination and his utter, his relentless quest to make yes. sure that things were made better. I mean, it really comes through in all of those examples. Yes. And Margaret, you assisted Charles, not only your, your, own, your own work, and you were describing that you, know, you had to find something to do, but you typed up all the notes, uh, which, which became the book. So, um, and, and what prompted Charles to write the book? Uh, I think it was um, Patrick McClure, who was a CEO of Aus Mission Australia, who said to Charles, with your knowledge and uh, with your history, well, surely we should have it written down. And uh, so Charles started in his long hand to write a book. And at the end of each chapter, he would read it out to me. And then I would uh, put it on a word processor, which the mission provided me with. And I was so grateful for. And uh, I began my history of computers. <laughs> and I thought, well, I better learn how to deal with them. So that was how it all began. And uh, obviously, it's a book that um, has produced good things in many people because you, I believe, pass it on to all the uh, employees of the mission. And you've had a reprint lately, which is wonderful. We have. We have had a reprint. And, uh, um, and I'll come a little later to... Um, uh, something else that we do with that book. And it is a fabulous book. And I would really encourage anybody who has a copy to read it. It's, it's, um, it's, a, short, it's a quick read, not because it's, uh, not because it's a short book necessarily, but it's just so beautifully written and so easy to read and so engaging and tells the story so excellently. And I'm, um, I'm, you probably wouldn't, uh, even if you had, Margaret, um, carried out some editing for, for readership, you probably would be too modest to say so, but it's a beautifully constructed book, and uh, you have clearly played a part in that. But also, you're, you touched there on, you know, use a, use, a, use a word processor and introduced you to the use of technology. And you're, you, you know, you're a very engaged person uh, using technology with social media posts and other, uh, and other um, engagements with the work of Mission Australia. Um, and clearly, you've remained very passionate about 
uh, about the organization. So what is it that drives your passion today? Well, I've never lost my love for Mission Australia and all that it does. And uh, unfortunately, as you well know, James, the need is just the same today as it was <laughs> in 1862 when Benjamin Short, bless his heart, came to Australia and started it. And uh, uh, there's always things to do and it'll never outgrow its work because there, look at all the homelessness that you've had to deal with this year alone. So uh, uh, how can anyone not be uh, enthusiastic about the mission's work and uh, I will always be because it's a love of mine and I believe it's what uh, you're carrying out in the name of Jesus Christ as you're loving your neighbour and this is must continue yeah. so thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you about it and to talk about dear Charles which is very obviously very dear to my heart. <laughs> no, and it comes across every, every time, Mark, and it's been a delight to be able to, to connect with you again. Um, and I, I'm going to move on to some questions from, uh, you know, from uh, the audience in a moment. I really want to thank you so much for sharing your time with us this morning and the wonderful stories and recollections. And uh, we will actually be sending our guests uh, in any, any of the guests today, uh, a copy of the book, a child's book, and I really encourage people to read that. And anybody who is a bequester uh, to Mission Australia um, uh, gets a copy of, of Charles's book. And yes, we've had to have a reprint, as you rightly say. But this week is anti-poverty week. And to your point, Margaret, you know, the challenges and, and, and uh, of, of life in Australia still exist today and uh, unfortunate and sad that that may be, it is the case that over 3 million people in Australia are living in poverty at the moment, this in, in this wealthy, uh, well-resourced country that we live in. And that includes over three quarters of a million children uh, mm -hmm. under the, uh, who are, uh, are living That's in poverty hard. and families are living in poverty. Mm -hmm. And as a charity, we rely on our generous supporters to continue our work. We're so grateful to everyone who supports our organisation. And uh, if you, any of you on the call would like to have a confidential conversation about leaving a gift in your will, then please contact Christine Thomas, our gifts and will coordinator, um, and uh, that, that, that number will be available to you. This is 9219-2000, but if you didn't get that, that's okay, we can share that with you. Many of you have already left um, uh, gifts in wills, and uh, I have, and my wife, also are requesters to Mission Australia, proud members of the Benjamin Short Society, which is the society uh, that we name uh, after Benjamin Short, the society of people who are the confirmed requesters. And we're motivated to do that because actually, you know, I know it's a cliche, but you can't take it all with you is our attitude. Now I'm not um, anticipating that Mission Australia is going to benefit from my request anytime soon. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping to do at least as well as Margaret, if, if not better, but, uh, you know, you can't take it all with you, and that's really much our, our view is, and we would, we believe deeply in the work of Mission Australia. And I know that Christine Thomas, who's our Gifts and Wills coordinator, is also mm -hmm. a question, and I'm not breaching a confidentiality, because there's a big honour board at National <laughs> Office, and Christine's name is on there, so I haven't, don't worry everybody, I haven't um, inadvertently carried out a data breach at that point. Um, but Christine, I know, is proud to be a, a, a requester of the organisation as well. Um, but I will just flick over to see if I've got, if there are some questions. I think, Dan, you're going to read out some of the questions for us. Oh, good morning, James. It's Christine here. I'm going to read some questions. Good morning, Margaret. Margaret, could you please tell us of the work of fundraising group Sydney City Mission Foundation, chaired by Bob Hawke, with prominent business and media personalities? Yes, that was a very happy night. It was in the Qantas hangar. And um, uh, Greg Norman had flown his own plane down, bringing his parents with him. And the tables were tables of 10. And we were raising money for um, the new centre in Riley Street, uh, which of course is, uh, uh, you know, the building in just down from Oxford Street. And um, Bob Hawke and Blanche were also our, our guests. And in the center of the table was a huge 
uh, vase of flowers. And halfway through, Bob said to uh, Charles, do you mind if I move that uh, uh, big vase of flowers because I can't see Blanche? <laughs> but the, the end of that night was that I think it was in the vicinity of over 700,000 was raised for that, that night, which was wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. Um, another question, what changes in poverty and disadvantage did Charles see in his life that worried him the most? Well, he saw in the beginning when he first joined um, the Sydney City Mission, uh, the queues for food, it was called a soup kitchen and it was down in um, Kent Street. And uh, he felt that that was, uh, surely we could do it better than that. It was, uh, they needed more dignity and uh, also having to almost beg for food uh, was, uh, he didn't feel was the right way. And also people were just put into a big dormitory with no privacy whatsoever uh, for those who were, were homeless and needed asleep. So uh, yes, that has improved. Um, but as you know, the homelessness situation is still bad. And I'm sure there are people still wanting food. I know we have it in our own area here in the Southern Highlands and uh, the churches and uh, all sorts of wonderful organizations are providing food for these people. We get a lot of food donated and we have a pantry that goes round in the in barrel and you know delivers food to people. So uh, in many ways, some of the things have improved, but some of them are still the same, as I was saying to James before. Thank you, Margaret. Now we've got another question. Um, what do you consider to be the most pressing needs in, society, in today's society when it comes to alleviating poverty and disadvantage? I think that um, we need homes that people can afford. I think home, that's, the, that's the problem now, that rents are prohibitive for most people uh, on, on a, not just an ordinary income. And uh, we need homes built that these people can rent at a reasonable price. Um, that's one of the things. Food, of course, is another. Uh, and people like Oz Harvest and these sort of people do a wonderful job uh, and all the other organizations. But uh, the need is still there and we must never forget that need. And, uh, um, we are so blessed if we have a home and we have food and clothing and warmth and so many people don't and I think uh, you know it's uh, that's the pressing need today but particularly homes uh, rents that people can afford. Thank you, Margaret. And um, another question, are you still in touch with any of the former board members and CEOs of Mission Australia, Sydney City Mission? Um, there's not many of us left, Christine. <laughs> um, but I did have a lovely call from Alan Patrick uh, yesterday, and uh, he was on the board of the mission with Charles. He's a, he was rector of Camden Church and has been a very dear friend of Charles. They came out of the Air Force and the Navy together in 1946. So they've been friends. So he is still alive at 96. And that's what Charles would be if he was still here. And um, that's, I think, those are most, and just the children of some of those people are in touch with me. Yes, rather than the people. Speaking about children, um, how did you and Charles encourage your family to be involved in philanthropic support of social services? Well, my daughter did a social work degree at uh, Sydney's and uh, so she went straight into that sort of thing. Uh, my son uh, has always been very interested in everything that, that uh, his father did and I do now. So, uh, uh, 
I, I just think the example is the perhaps the best way of teaching your children these sort of things and thinking of other people all the time rather than yourself. So uh, uh, I don't know that there's a set pattern for bringing children up for that sort of thing, but some people are going to take to it and others are not. But uh, our children both were very, very enthusiastic about Charles' work and supported him all the time. And that's all the questions. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you very much, Christine. And thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you. And, and thanks, thanks, Christine. And thank you, Margaret. And um, absolutely, uh, it must be so hard to remember everybody's names, but you've shown in your answers, you are absolutely on top of what's happening in, in Australian society and the challenges that are around us today. And, uh, your answer in relation to affordability of housing is, is absolutely spot on. It is at the root of so many challenges that we experience um, and see as an organisation. So um, great to hear you um, mention that. And then to the question of giving, and you talked about how do you encourage your children to give? And I know that uh, you know your faith is a very important thing to you, and I, and I uh, it puts me in mind of. Uh, what Paul says in his uh, one of his letters to the Corinthians, which when he talks about the importance of deciding in your heart to give something, not to do it reluctantly or under mm -hmm. compulsion, um, and this is very much the uh, the heart of what we uh, what we brought this group together to talk about is to really ask is it, if it is in your heart to give, we're not going to we're not trying to compel you or twist your arms, but if it's in your heart to give and you are able to share. Um, do please speak to Christine um, from the point of view of a gifts and wills pledge in the organ for, for Mission Australia. Or um, if you felt that you wanted to make a, 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 real, a real time, if you like, donation to Mission Australia, we'd be very happy to hear from you as well. But Margaret, thank you so much for sharing your time with us on what would have been your 70th wedding anniversary, for sharing your stories of Charles and your modest. Um, a recount of your role in, in so much of the success and the uh, incredibly pivotal role that Charles has played in the history of Mission Australia. We are very, very grateful to him and to you for your ongoing connection and support for us as an organisation. And we wish you um, very, very well for, uh, for the rest of your wedding anniversary day and, and beyond. And thank you to everybody for attending today's event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.